Hi, my name is Caden Brott. Uh, I'm going to be doing the call to worship today. And so I go to youth group here, um, go to Hempfield High School. Um, and my dad used to be the pastor here. So Psalm 128. Blessed are all those who fear the Lord, who walk in his ways. You will eat the fruit of your labor. Blessings and prosperity will be yours. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your sons will be like olive shoots around your table. Thus is the man blessed who fears the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion all the days of your life. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem, and may you live to see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. Um, Lord God, please just be with this church today. Help Josh to have a good sermon. Um, Just thank you for everyone that can gather here today and help us to honor you in whatever we do. Amen. First Timothy 3, 1 through 7. Here is a trustworthy saying. If anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. Now the overseer must be above reproach. The husband of but one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may be conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with his outsiders, so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. Lord, thank you just for all the blessings of everyone that is here today. Um, Help us all to just go deeper into scripture and to learn something new and Just be open to whatever you want us to hear. Amen. So I want to thank Caden for doing this because kind of asked him last but and I'll be moving this stuff but I wanted to read uh, Titus chapter 1 verses 10 through 16 for you and I'm reading from the ESV so it won't line up but you can still follow along for there are many who are insubordinate empty talkers and deceivers especially those of the circumcision party 
They must be silenced, since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain, what they ought not to. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons, and this testimony is true. Therefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. I wanted to read that one myself because we'll, we'll get to that later. And I just want you to remember this scripture as well. So let me turn my mic on quick. set up now. <laughs> so I was really excited about today because I wanted to share this message with you all. It was one that I really enjoyed studying myself. It was one I really enjoyed diving deeper into the word with. But if I'm going to be honest with you, I'm really looking forward to tomorrow. Because tomorrow, my wife Gloria and I get to go down to Shenandoah State Park for the week and celebrate our second wedding anniversary. So... <laughs> Thank you. So it's really excited, and I'll also preface by saying I was looking up the traditional uh, wedding gifts that you give based on the anniversaries, and this year it's the uh, cotton wedding gift. And I'm like, I have no idea what to do. Um, I'll have her pick it and I'll buy it for her. <laughs> so, sorry. <laughs> and some of you might be thinking, second wedding anniversary. I remember that. They're so young. <laughs> and while you're remembering, I want you to remember back to a manager or a boss that you might have loved. Somebody who you just trusted with the work that you were doing. Somebody that you looked up to with the job. And I'll also say that I've never had a boss I didn't like. And I'm not just saying that because my father was also my boss at one point. And dad, if you end up listening or watching this, I mean it. Seriously. But I want to talk about the first manager that I ever had. His name is Bobby, and it was when I worked at the House of Pizza in Willow Street. There she is. <laughs> it was my first job when I was in eighth grade. I was about 13 years old. And Bobby was just the greatest. First off, he was a believer. And so we got to talk about faith, challenge each other to grow. And it was great to have that in a work environment as well as in the church. He had a great reputation. Everyone who worked there loved him. They only had great things to say about him. Even the customers would always be like, where's Bobby? Is he working today? I want to see that guy. He's an honest man. He admitted his shortcomings. He admitted when things didn't go right, when it was his fault, and he would always apologize and try to atone for it. He would never try to pass the blame or never use his position to get out of an issue. He's a good husband and father. He always put his wife first. If there's ever an issue, it was always on his mind. It was always present. And he also loved and cared for his kids so much. I remember helping him name his firstborn as well, which was really cool to do. Um, and lastly, he knew how to handle conflict and issues well. There was a time where him and another employee were trying to train me and stuff, and they had different opinions on it. It was kind of like the sharp disagreement that rose between Paul and, Sil or Paul and Barnabas. And Paul took Silas and left, and Barnabas took John Mark and left. Well, what Bobby did was he stepped outside with this guy and said, let's talk about this out here because we shouldn't be fighting about this in the workplace. And I still remember that because it was a respectful thing to do. And that way I wasn't the 13-year-old standing in front of the two people arguing and just waiting for me to do something. Everyone wants a Bobby taking care of things, right? Everybody wants that trustworthy, dependable person. And 
it's perks too if they're a believer because then you share your faith and you share in your drive for life. And that leads me to today's sermon. Today we're going to be talking about elders and overseers. Aptly named the Elder Scrolls because we're talking about elders and it was written on scrolls. It just kind of came together. So if you will, turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 3. And follow along on your devices, on your, uh, with your Bibles. Because we're going to be talking about biblical leadership and the call that is presented to those who seek after this role. And again, I want to thank Caden for helping me out today. Um, it was on short notice. I didn't give him much prep, and he still, he still did a great job. So thank you so much. So follow with me. I'm reading from the ESV. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer... He desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with the conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he might not fall into disgrace, into the snare of the devil. Before I dive in, I want to do a little promo for this book. This is a commentary book written by Philip Towner. This is where I got most, if not all, of my information for my sermon today. I highly recommend it. It's about $20 online. If you don't feel like spending money, you can borrow my copy. I just would like you to wash it before you return it. So it's just a, it's a series that they do, and this one specifically is on First and Second Timothy and Titus, which works out for the series we're doing. So first, let's define some terms. Who are elders and overseers? What does that look like? So I went online, and I found through the Oxford English Dictionary, otherwise known as the first result when you Google definition of elder, is that an elder is a leader or senior figure in a tribe or other group. Likewise with overseer, a person who supervises others, especially workers. So if you're a visual thinker like me, you need some kind of picture. So for elder, the first thing that came to mind was a village elder of the Native American tribe. Somebody who's been through life, been through the issues that are going on, has wisdom and guidance to give to the rest of the tribe. They're trustworthy, they're true, and you can rely on them. And likewise with overseer, think about a supervisor. Don't know what to do with your job? Ask a supervisor. Don't know how to do it? Ask a supervisor. Did you do it right? Ask a supervisor. And if you're lucky, they'll answer. You put those two things together in the church, and what do you get? You get somebody like Peter. Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 5, refers to himself as a fellow elder, somebody who is leading the church, presiding over a certain aspect of it. So within the church, this looks like someone who is taking charge of an aspect of the ministry. It might be outreach, it might be the education side, it might be caring for people who are coming from outside, need a place to stay, need food. Things that maybe the heads of our teams take care of, the chairs of our teams. So think that. If you're a chair of a team, which by the way, we have the ballots going around, so don't forget to fill those out. Um, you take care of the similar roles to what the elders and overseers took care of. So now we get to the deep part. And if you're feeling a little tired right now, I actually recommend that you stand up and shake it out a little bit because we're going to be diving in a little deep here today. It's going to be an intensive list of 14 qualifications because if Paul wrote it to be serious, we're going to take it as serious. So let's go. First one is being above reproach. What does that mean? Well, being above reproach, again, as the Oxford English Dictionary defines it, is the expression of disapproval or disappointment. 
So if I were to take the teens from the youth group on a day trip and forget the paperwork of their registration forms that has medical information, and one of the teens gets stung by a bee, and I don't know where the EpiPen is because I didn't know that they needed an EpiPen, and they're reacting to the bee and their face is starting to swell up. I'm like, what's wrong, what's wrong? And they're like, but, but, but they can't talk because their lips are swelling up. Their parents would say, I don't really approve of that. That wasn't very good. And it wouldn't be good. I would be in a very bad position. I would have fallen in my leadership role. Not good at all. So being above reproach means that doesn't happen to you. However, this term needs further definition, and the way that we're going to further define it is by going through the other 13 qualifications of this. Again, this is going to be intense, so if you need to take notes to keep with it, please take notes. Take out your phones. You should have a note tablet on there. The next qualification is the husband of one wife. Literally, the Greek here means a one-woman man. I love that phrase. Now, commentaries and other theologians have tried to define this term in the past, and they're trying to understand what the husband of one wife means and what Paul is defining this as. So we'll look at some potential definitions of this phrase, and then we'll pick the correct one at the end. So the first thing that people think Paul is getting at when he says being the husband of one wife is that he's prohibiting polygamy. Makes sense. You have one wife. Uh, don't be like David and Solomon, who has multiple wives. You need to be devoted to one. Okay? The other definition that they suggest is that this is excluding the widowed and remarried. Interesting. The next one is excluding the divorced and remarried. You might have some biblical support for this one even, but let's keep going. The last one is demanding faithfulness in marriage. So let's backtrack. Prohibiting polygamy? Well, the Roman Empire actually looked down on polygamy. It was not a widely practiced thing. If you practice it, you were seen as an outcast, a weirdo. They didn't like it. So we can cross that one out. Excluding the widowed and remarried? Well, Paul even writes at one point that if you are young enough and widowed, you should remarry. So we can cross that one out. And then excluding the divorced and remarried. And though you might try to have some biblical support for this one, the wording here actually cancels this definition out. So we're left with only one possible solution here. That Paul is demanding that if you were to be an overseer in the church, you need to be faithful in your marriage. I can remember some young man preaching on an aspect of this back in August. That's me. Paul here in his wording is actually being positive, not prohibitive. What I mean by that is Paul is encouraging one thing, not discouraging others. He is saying that if you are to be an overseer in the church, you need to be faithful to your wife. You need to love her sacrificially, agape-style love. Personal life has serious consequences. As Paul said in verse 5, for if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? And we'll dive into that a little bit later too. So we keep going, and we're on to the third one, and I'll try to rush through these quickly, but I'll speak slow so I don't lose you. The next one is temperate or sober-minded. This is specifically referring to clarity of thought, not necessarily about drunkenness, although we will get to that one as well. And being temperate, or having temperance, is keeping guard against spiritual laziness. If you allow for yourself to fall out of the study of the word, of prayer, you lose that clarity that comes with God's word. And therefore, when you go to make judgment, it is clouded, it is oftentimes wrong, and it doesn't come from a holy place. So being temperate is having clarity for wisdom. The next qualification that Paul gives is being self-controlled. Now, this is a basic, observable aspect of Christian life. I mean, it's the last fruit of the Spirit. So if we are of the Spirit, we should show this fruit, right? And Paul's trying to say, if you're going to be an overseer, you need to exemplify this. Again, 
See Galatians, see First and Second Timothy and Titus. It said throughout that you should have self-control. And this is control over impulsive behavior. That means if you're driving down the road and you see a really nice car, maybe a Camaro or a Corvette that you really like, but the APR financing is really high and the monthly payments that you would have to pay are also very high and you don't know if financially you can make that commitment, but you know what, you're gonna do it anyway because that's the car you've wanted to drive since 11th grade in high school. That's a lack of self-control. Or a more relatable one to this season, you have a lot of Halloween chocolate in the house that's left over from Halloween. Don't eat it all at once or you're gonna hurt. That's self-control. Choosing to abstain from the things of overindulgence that will hurt you. So that's self-control. The next one is respectable. And respectable goes hand in hand with being self-controlled. It is the balance of self-control with your outward actions or outward behavior. So that means whatever you do on the outside, you know, actions speak louder than words. That is being respectable. And in the Roman culture, they saw this as a balance of the strength of life, which is your inner control or your self-control, and the beauty of life, which is your outer balance or your outer actions as a result of your self-control. So be respectable, show it on the outside. Hospitable. We know this one. I'm going to make a meal for somebody and drop it off. I'm going to have them over for dinner. That's hospitality. Well, it's a little more than that. To be hospitable means to share your home, your resources, and your life with those who are truly in need. And the reason why I want to make this specification is because, again, Roman culture, Paul's writing to a Roman church. They understand that there is massive persecution going on in the day, that people are being driven from their homes, that they're losing their family members, that their namesake has been slandered, that they've been beaten, imprisoned, often near death, sometimes even killed, and those who survive with nothing, are roaming around looking for a home, looking for love, looking for a family. They find it in the church when they are hospitable. Being hospitable in this context means opening up your life to another person. The next one is being able to teach. And this one specifically relates to the issue today. If you remember from the past few sermons, we understand that there are false teachers in this church at Ephesus that Timothy is at. And so Paul is saying, to be an overseer, you need to be able to teach the truth. Now this is more than just Sunday school or preaching, but this is teaching in everyday circumstances. This means that you're able to communicate the truth to anyone at any given time, not just at the pulpit, not just in a Sunday school classroom. It means in your home, to the neighbor that you have, and to the stranger on the street. And also, this might not be equally present in all overseers. Some might be really great at teaching to the point where they are up front teaching and leading. Others, it might be just as simple as, I tell my kids about the Bible. And that's great. Both are acceptable. As long as you strive for teaching and being able to use that gift. The next four, so we got through this list. This is kind of like inner stuff. These are all aspects that have to do with your inner self, your control yourself, rapport. The next four are things that are prohibited. These are things that you shouldn't do. The first of that is being a drunkard. So this first prohibition is about a lack of self-control. If you're drunk, you can't control your body, your mind, your thoughts, your words, and you stumble around. You know, the cartoons of being like Tom and Jerry. They fall out of the wine barrel and the little mouse is just wobbling around. He has no control. And being a drunkard means that you have become a slave to another thing in this world. And it might not just be alcohol. It might be numerous things. You might be a slave to so many different things that cloud your judgment and make you drunk that you can't think straight that you lose yourself amongst all that, and you lose self-control. So we see that drunkenness is a loss of control over the body, and you become a slave to something else. The only person that we should submit control to is the Holy Spirit. He should be the one working through us, and if 
we are allowing other things outside of us to have that control, we can't give it up to the Holy Spirit who should be doing the work. The next prohibition is being violent. Be nonviolent. It's pretty simple. And again, it's directly related to self-control. However, rather than a self-control with outward things like alcohol or whatever else it might be, this is a issue on the inner self. This is a taming of your emotions. Because if you can't have control over your emotions, they will have control over you. And therefore, you lose your respectability. You lose that outward beauty. Maturity and strength stem from gentleness. And we see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1, because Paul writes, I, Paul, myself, entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Meekness and gentleness, not violence and strength. Nonviolent. The next one, the next qualification for an elder is not quarrelsome. Pointless arguments that divide relationships. And this is very common with the false teachers in Ephesus. These people are coming in and saying, here's some little thing that isn't that important in your life. We're going to make it this big. And we're going to fight about it. And it divides relationships and it hurts people and it drives people away. And might I even ask or, or suggest that that might look today as fighting about who we're voting for in the next election. Because if our allegiance is towards Christ, then those issues shouldn't be divisive in the church. Rather than fighting about who we're voting for, maybe we talk about, hey, here's a sin issue that's in my life. Here's something that's going on that I'm struggling with. Here's something I should celebrate within my faith. Not quarrelsome. Not a lover of money. Because money is the ultimate controller in this situation. Money can take away your temperance. You lose that clarity of thought because you think about, oh, how can I be making or saving money in this decision? You lose that self-controlledness because you want to make as much or maybe spend as much as possible. You lose that respectability because you're willing to do anything for money. You lose that hospitality because I don't want to spend money on somebody else. It doesn't benefit me at all. And it loses your ability to teach if you are a slave to money because you charge money to teach then. You see, being a lover of money means that you don't have a healthy detachment from material possessions, but it also means that you don't have responsibility over it. As Christians, we should have both a detachment from material wealth and a responsibility over it. A wise man named Dave Ramsey oftentimes preaches this, of having a wise responsibility over it. And similarly, Paul wrote earlier on in chapter 2, to the women, and might I suggest that applies to everyone today, that they were, should dress modestly, wear respectable apparel, and have self-control. And this has to do with material possessions. So don't be a lover of money. And here are the last three, and these have to do with outward relationships. And again, I hope you guys are paying attention because I'm going somewhere where I hope you don't realize I'm going because I really want that fun plot twist at the end but if I don't have it, that's okay. If you see right through this and you see where I'm going, awesome. The next one is managing his household well. This goes in tandem with marriage. The home life and how well the house is led should indicate a quality of leadership. You see somebody who cares for their kids, cares for their wife, puts them first, always is sacrificing for them, leading them well. You see that and you say, that will translate well in the church. And it should. Like Paul said in, in verse 5, for if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? This includes, though, the, Reco the, Gro uh, pardon, the Greco Roman perception of husband as head, wife, children, and slaves. This is what Paul is addressing because, again, they live under a different culture. You might be asking, Josh, what do I do about the slaves part? Because I don't have slaves. We don't have slaves. And yes, slavery is a terrible thing. And we don't have that today. So let me add a different caveat to it. How do you treat the plumber, the electrician, or the landscaper that comes and works on your property? Do you, man, do you demand 
perfection from them? Or else you want a refund on your job? Or do you offer up drinks to them? Do you need some water? Do you offer up food to them? Do you ask, how can I be praying for you? Caring for their physical and spiritual needs. Because I worked a little bit of blue collar, and I will say, we have encountered some very rude people who also have a, as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord over the door frame. Not yet. Anything out of line from this Greco-Roman perception was seen as insubordination against the Roman Empire and as a break from societal norms. And Paul is trying to say, we're not here to break these societal norms, just like Christ wasn't here to break societal norms in the Roman Empire. That's why he didn't speak against slavery. However, he spoke about your personal self. He spoke about how you are to change, become more like him, so that those societal norms will break. So that as people become more aware of who they are in Christ, and they become more aware of how they should be as Christians and how they shouldn't be, they say, slavery is bad, and then they break away from it. So I just want to make that clear, too, and that we're not promoting slavery by any means. And lastly, this qualification here of managing your household well was not ex- does not exclude unmarried from leadership, because Paul himself promoted singleness in leadership. We all knew that. So I got two more. Hang with me, two more. The qualification here is that they cannot be a new believer. It's not for lack of leadership skills, because they might as well have those, but it's for a lack of spiritual maturity. Because new believers at times, and specifically within this church, saw it as a way to get by, a way to promote themselves, a way to grow and increase in where they're at in stature. And I also want to say that it's not the fault of the individual for being put in that position. Rather, it's the fault of the church for allowing them to be there. So the church in Ephesus allowed these false teachers to be there because they didn't care about where they were at spiritually. They were conceited, and they fall under the judgment that the devil receives. These are people that were given a role of leadership and will not be able to live up to it and will try to take what they can, as we understand the devil tried to do in heaven when he was cast down. The last one. Thank you for hanging on. Good reputation with outsiders. You might have the best reputation within your church, but if not a single person outside these walls know you, how are you going to make disciples? How are you going to share the gospel? That's the idea behind this with Paul writing to the church in Ephesus. He's saying, if you're going to be an overseer or uh, an elder, it is a very noble task. But you've got to know people outside the church so that you can let your light shine. So why is this important? Well... Let me go back to Titus. And I'm actually going to go back to this list, and I'm going to read through this real quick. And look at this list and see where what I read in Titus also parallels with what's on this list. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what rem- remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. In one wording or another, practically all of those are on that same list. Paul is saying how important this list is because he wrote it twice to two separate people. And that leads me to why it's so important. He wrote to the church in Ephesus because they had an issue. What was their issue? What was their issue, guys? Heresy. Heresy. False teachers. 
People coming in and saying the wrong things about Jesus. Coming in for their own gain and not for Christ's gain. What was the issue in Crete? As I read earlier, verses 10 through 16, false teaching, heresies. Jewish believers coming in and saying, you need to follow these Old Testament laws of cleanliness laws and not eating pork and circumcision. You need to do all those things to be saved. And Paul's like, no, you don't need to do those things to be saved. What is our issue today? We fall into false teaching. We fall into these things that seem like truth, seem like they come from God, seem like it might be right, but the reality is it's something that has been born out of human thought, born out of sinful thought. This idea that your sin is okay, or this idea that you can do whatever you want, let me be me, YOLO, all those different things. I don't think we say that anymore, so that's okay. These all come from false teaching. When a believer says, let me do me and you do you, when they're sinning, false teaching. They believe a lie. In verse 12, Paul quoted a poet. His name's Epimenides. And Epimenides says, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. And he's absolutely right. Which is why Cretan is an insult that we know of today. I myself can be referred to as a Cretan outside of Christ. Because I am, outside of Christ, a liar, an evil beast, and a lazy glutton. So both Ephesus and Crete had these liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons, and they needed to fight against it. They needed sound teaching. And they needed leaders to come up and lead, to teach sound doctrine, to be hospitable, to have good character, and to be above reproach. Where do the leaders come from, though? The leaders come from the group. So if we're a group where the leaders are wolves in sheep's clothes, how are we going to preach the word? How are we going to preach the truth? And I'm not saying that we have that here. Because I trust you guys. I know your hearts. I know that the truth is in you and that your lights are shining. But I want to say that we need to be on guard. I need to be on guard. Here's my big picture for you all because I love these big pictures. If you need one thing to come from this, we are all called to a higher standard everyone in here. Here's a quote from Towner in this commentary. He says, as a guide to spiritual maturity, this code or these qualifications are applicable to all believers. Everyone. The only difference between everyone else and the overseers is that with the overseers, they are expected before they can take that role. For us as believers, we need to keep working at getting them. I believe that there are signs around town that say progress, not perfection. And it's so true. Because we are continuously being sanctified by the Holy Spirit, being changed and morphed more into Christ as the days go by. But we need to continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. If we're not, we lose our temperance, we lose self-control, we lose our respectability, we become less hospitable, we teach less, and more and more and more we become less like Christ. So let's look at this list again. And I'll come back to the challenge then. It's a daunting list, right? There's 14 different things there. I don't know if I'll include being above reproach because that kind of applies to all of them. But my challenge, and I'll bring the list back up then, my challenge for all of us, break out your phone, Get pen and paper. If you don't have paper, but you have a pen, write on your hand. It's okay, I did it all through college and high school. And I want you to pick one of this list, and I want you to write it down right now. Like, please do this. I've already picked mine. I need to be more respectful. My outward actions, when I'm around other believers that are my friends, I need to be better. I need to act better. I need to live to the standard that I'm called to and not hide behind the excuse of, well, there are other believers. I can slip a little bit. There's grace. 
Because the more, we, uh, more I allow myself to do that, the more I start to fall into bad rhythms, bad patterns. So pick one. Write it down. And for one month, can I challenge you this? One month, we're all going to work on that one that we write down. And after a month is done, so I, it, today's the 11th, on November 11th, look back and you say, in one month, have I gotten better? Have I gotten worse? Have I stayed the same? Pick one. Write it down. Let me pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that there is truth in it that changes us. For in you we are new creations. We thank you that it is progress and not perfection. But I pray now that we continue to progress more towards you. More towards your son, becoming more like him. Because we need to be more like him so that our light can shine brightest in this dark world, so that we can be seen as one unified, grace-loving people. Lord, I pray that these efforts going forward of practicing one of these aspects will be fruitful. That as we become a part of your vine as we're growing as parts of the vine, as we're branches of that vine, that we will continue to produce fruit. I thank you, Lord, and I pray that we will adhere to you, stay true to you, and stay true to your word. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. John 15, 5 says this. And yes, it's my college notes, but it stuck with me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. It's a sobering reminder that as we pursue changing, growing, becoming more like Christ, We can't do it on our own. We need Christ. We need the Holy Spirit. We cannot become more like him if we try to do it on our own. His grace is sufficient for us. For his power is made perfect in our weakness. So let's grow in him together. God bless you all. On behalf of Hempfield Church of the Brethren, we thank you for joining us for today's service. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.